Moby Dick by Herman Melville Chapters 36 to 40 Chapter 36 The Quarter Deck Enter Ahab, then all. It was not a great while after the affair of the pipe that one morning, shortly after breakfast, Ahab, as was his wont, ascended the cabin gangway to the deck. There most sea captains usually walk at that hour as country gentlemen, after the same meal take a few turns in the garden. Soon his steady, ivory stride was heard, as to and fro he paced his old rounds, upon planks so familiar to his tread that they were all over dented, like geological stones, with the peculiar mark of his walk. Did you fixedly gaze, too, upon that ribbed and dented brow, there also you would see still stranger footprints, the footprints of his one unsleeping, ever-pacing thought. But on the occasion in question those dents looked deeper, even as his nervous step that morning left a deeper mark. And so full of his thought was Ahab that at every uniform turn that he made, now at the mainmast and now at the binnacle, you could almost see that thought turn in him as he turned, and pace in him as he paced, so completely possessing him indeed, that it all but seemed the inward mould of every outer movement. "'Do you mark him, Flask?' whispered Stubb. "'The chick that's in him pecks the shell. "'Twill soon be out.' The hours wore on. Ahab now shut up within his cabin, anon pacing the deck with the same intense bigotry of purpose in his aspect. It drew near the close of day. Suddenly he came to a halt by the bulwarks, and, inserting his bone leg into the auger hole there, and with one hand grasping a shroud, he ordered Starbuck to send everybody aft. "'Sir,' said the mate, astonished at an order seldom or never given on shipboard except in some extraordinary case. "'Send everybody aft,' repeated Ahab. "'Masthead's there. Come down.' When the entire ship's company were assembled, and with curious and not wholly unapprehensive faces were eyeing him, for he looked not unlike the weather horizon when a storm is coming up, Ahab, after rapidly glancing over the bulwarks, and then darting his eyes among the crew, started from his standpoint, and, as though not a soul were nigh him, resumed his heavy turns upon the deck. With bent head and half-slouched hat he continued to pace, unmindful of the wondering whispering among the men, till Stubb cautiously whispered to Flask that Ahab must have summoned them there for the purpose of witnessing a pedestrian feat. But this did not last long. Vehemently pausing, he cried, "'What do you do when you see a whale, men?' "'Sing out for him,' was the impulsive rejoinder from a score of clubbed voices. "'Good!' cried Ahab, with a wild approval in his tones, observing the hearty animation into which his unexpected question had so magnetically thrown them. "'And what do you do next, men?' "'Lower away, and after him.' "'And what tune is it you pull to, men?' "'A dead whale or a stove-boat.' More and more strangely and fiercely glad and approving grew the countenance of the old man at every shout, while the mariners began to gaze curiously at each other, as if marvelling how it was that they themselves became so excited at such seemingly purposeless questions. But they were all eagerness again, as Ahab, now half revolving in his pivot-hole, with one hand reaching high up a shroud, and tightly, almost convulsively grasping it, addressed them thus. All ye mastheaders have before now heard me give orders about a white whale. Look ye, do you see this Spanish ounce of gold? Holding up a broad, bright coin to the sun. It is a sixteen-dollar piece, men. Do you see it? Mr. Starbuck, hand me yon top maul. While the mate was getting the hammer, Ahab, without speaking, was slowly rubbing the gold piece against the skirts of his jacket, as if to heighten its luster, and without using any words was meanwhile lowly humming to himself, producing a sound so strangely muffled and inarticulate 
that it seemed the mechanical humming of the wheels of his vitality in him. Receiving the top maul from Starbuck, he advanced towards the mainmast with the hammer uplifted in one hand, exhibiting the gold with the other, and with a high raised voice exclaiming, "'Whosoever of ye raises me a white-headed whale, with a wrinkled brow and a crooked jaw, whosoever of ye raises me that white-headed whale, with three holes punctured in his starboard fluke, look ye, whosoever of ye raises me that same white whale, he shall have this gold ounce, my boys!' "'Huzzah! Huzzah!' cried the seamen, as with swinging tarpaulins they hailed the act of nailing the gold to the mast. "'It's a white whale, I say,' resumed Ahab, as he threw down the top maul. "'A white whale! Skin your eyes for him, men! Look sharp for white water! If you see but a bubble, sing out!' All this while Tashtego, Dagoo, and Queequeg had looked on with even more intense interest and surprise than the rest, and at the mention of the wrinkled brow and crooked jaw, they had started as if each was separately touched by some specific recollection. "'Captain Ahab,' said Tashtego, "'that white whale must be the same that some call Moby Dick.' "'Moby Dick!' shouted Ahab. "'Do you know the white whale, then, Tash?' "'Does he fantail a little curious, sir, before he goes down?' said the gay-header, deliberately. "'And he has a curious spout, too,' said Dagoo. "'Very bushy, even for a parmacetti. And mighty quick, Captain Ahab?' "'And he have one, two, three, oh! Good many iron in him hide, too, Captain,' cried Queequeg disjointedly. "'All twisky-ty, uh, betwisk like him, him,' faltering hard for a word." and screwing his hand round and round as though uncorking a bottle. Like him, him! Corkscrew! cried Ahab. Aye, Queequeg, the harpoons lie all twisted and wrenched in him. Aye, Dagoo, his spout is a big one, like a whole shock of wheat, and white as a pile of our Nantucket wool after the great annual sheep-shearing. Aye, Tashtego, and he fantails like a split jib in a squall. Death and devils, men. It is Moby Dick you have seen. Moby Dick! Moby Dick! Captain Ahab, said Starbuck, who, with stub and flask, had thus far been eyeing his superior with increasing surprise, but at last seemed struck with a thought, which somewhat explained all the wonder. Captain Ahab, I have heard of Moby Dick, but it was not Moby Dick that took off thy leg. "'Who told thee that?' cried Ahab, then pausing. "'Aye, Starbuck. Aye, my hearties, all around. "'It was Moby Dick that dismasted me. "'Moby Dick that brought me to this dead stump I stand on now. "'Aye, aye!' he shouted with a terrific, loud, animal sob, "'like that of a heart-stricken moose. "'Aye, aye!' It was that accursed white whale that razied me, made a poor pegging lubber of me forever and a day. Then, tossing both arms with measureless imprecations, he shouted out, Aye, aye, and I'll chase him round Good Hope, and round the Horn, and round the Norway Maelstrom, and round Perdition's flames before I give him up. And this is what ye have shipped for, men to chase that white whale on both sides of land and over all sides of the earth till he spouts black blood and rolls fin out. What say ye, men? Will ye splice hands on it now? I think ye do look brave. Aye, aye, shouted the harpooners and the seamen, running closer to the excited old man. A sharp eye for the white whale, a sharp lance for Moby Dick. God bless ye. He seemed to half sob and half shout. God bless ye, men. Steward, go draw the great measure of grog. But what's this long face about, Mr. Starbuck? Wilt thou not chase the white whale? Art not game for Moby Dick? I am game for his crooked jaw and for the jaws of death, too, Captain Ahab, if it fairly come in the way of the business we follow. 
but I came here to hunt whales, not my commander's vengeance. How many barrels will thy vengeance yield thee, even if thou gettest it, Captain Ahab? It will not fetch thee much in our Nantucket market. Nantucket market! Hoot! But come closer, Starbuck. Thou requirest a little lower layer. If money's to be the measurer, man, and the accountants have computed their great counting-house the globe by girdling it with guineas, one to every three parts of an inch, then let me tell thee that my vengeance will fetch a great premium here. He smites his chest, whispered Stubb. What's that for? Methinks it rings most vast, but hollow. Vengeance on a dumb brute, cried Starbuck that simply smote thee from blindest instinct. Madness! To be enraged with a dumb thing, Captain Ahab, seems blasphemous. Hark ye yet again! The little lower layer! All visible objects, man, are but as pasteboard masks. But in each event, in the living act, the undoubted deed, there some unknown but still reasoning thing puts forth the mouldings of its features from behind the unreasoning mask. If man will strike, strike through the mask. How can the prisoner reach outside except by thrusting through the wall? To me the white whale is that wall shoved near to me. Sometimes I think there's naught beyond, but tis enough. He tasks me, he heaps me. I see in him outrageous strength, but with an inscrutable malice sinewing it. That inscrutable thing is chiefly what I hate. And be the white whale agent, or be the white whale principal, I will wreak that hate upon him. Talk not to me of blasphemy, man. I'd strike the sun if it insulted me. For could the sun do that, then I could do the other since there is ever a sort of fair play herein, jealousy presiding over all creations. But not my master man is even that fair play. Who's over me? Truth hath no confines. Take off thine eye, more intolerable than fiend's glarings as a doltish stare. So, so, thou reddenest and palest. My heat has melted thee to anger glow. But look ye, Starbuck, what is said in heat, that thing unsays itself. There are men from whom warm words are small indignity. I meant not to incense thee. Let it go. Look, see yonder Turkish cheeks of spotted tawn, living, breathing pictures painted by the sun. The pagan leopards, the unwrecking and unworshipping things that live and seek, and give no reason for the torrid life they feel. The crew, man, the crew, are they not one and all with Ahab in this matter of the whale? See Stubb, he laughs. See yonder Chilean, he snorts to think of it. Stand up amidst the general hurricane, thy one tossed sapling cannot, Starbuck. And what is it? Reckon it. Tis but to help strike a fin, no wondrous feat for Starbuck. What is it more? From this one poor hunt, then, the best lance out of all Nantucket, surely he will not hang back, when every foremast hand has clutched a whetstone. Ah, constraining seize thee, I see. The billow lifts thee. Speak, but speak. Ay, ay, thy silence, then, that voices thee. Aside. Something shot from my dilated nostrils. He has inhaled it in his lungs. Starbuck now is mine. Cannot oppose me now without rebellion. God keep me. Keep us all, murmured Starbuck, lowly. But in his joy at the enchanted, tacit acquiescence of the mate, Ahab did not hear his foreboding invocation nor yet the low laugh from the hold, nor yet the presaging vibrations of the winds in the cordage, nor yet the hollow flap of the sails against the mass, 
as for a moment their hearts sank in. For, again, Starbuck's downcast eyes lighted up with the stubbornness of life, the subterranean laugh died away, the winds blew on, the sails filled out, the ship heaved and rolled as before. Ah, ye admonitions and warnings, why stay ye not when ye come? But rather are ye predictions than warnings, ye shadows. Yet not so much predictions from without, as verifications of the foregoing things within. For with little external to constrain us, the innermost necessities of our being, these still drive us on. The measure! The measure! cried Ahab. Receiving the brimming pewter, and turning to the harpooners, he ordered them to produce their weapons. Then, ranging them before him near the capstan, with their harpoons in their hands, while his three mates stood at his side with their lances, and the rest of the ship's company formed a circle round the group, he stood for an instant searchingly eyeing every man of his crew. But those wild eyes met his, as the bloodshot eyes of the prairie wolves meet the eye of their leader, ere he rushes on at their head in the trail of the bison, but, alas, only to fall into the hidden snare of the Indian. "'Drink and pass!' he cried, handing the heavy charged flagon to the nearest seaman. "'The crew alone now drink. Round with it, round! Short draughts, long swallows, men, tis hot as Satan's hoof. So, so, it goes round excellently. It spiralizes in ye, forks out at the serpent's snapping eye. Well done, almost drained. That way it went, this way it comes. Hand it me. Here's a hollow. Ha, <laughs> men, you seem the years. So brimming life is gulped and gone. Steward, refill. Attend now, my braves. I have mustered you round this capstan. And ye mates, flank me with your lances, and ye harpooners, stand there with your irons. And you stout mariners, ring me in, that I may in some sort revive a noble custom of my fishermen fathers before me. O oh, men, you will yet see that, ha, boy, come back, bad pennies come not sooner. Hand it me. Why, now this pewter had run brimming again, wert not thou St. Vitus's imp. Away, thou ague! Advance, ye mates. Cross your lances full before me. Well done. Let me touch the axis. So saying, with extended arm, he grasped the three level radiating lances at their cross centers, while so doing suddenly and nervously twitched them. Meanwhile, glancing intently from Starbuck to Stubb, from Stubb to Flask, it seemed as though by some nameless interior volition he would fain have shocked into them the same fiery emotion accumulated within the laden jar of his own magnetic life. The three mates quailed before his strong, sustained, and mystic aspect. Stubb and Flask looked sideways from him. The honest eye of Starbuck fell downright. "'In vain!' cried Ahab. "'But maybe tis well.' For did ye three but once take the full-forced shock, then mine own electric thing, that perhaps had expired from out me. Perchance, too, it would have dropped ye dead. Perchance ye need it not. Down, lances! And now, ye mates, I do appoint ye three cup-bearers to my three pagan kinsmen there. Yon three most honorable gentlemen and noblemen, my valiant harpooners, disdain the task? What, when the great Pope washes the feet of beggars, using his tiara for ewer? Oh, my sweet cardinals, your own condescension, that shall bend ye to it. I do not order ye, ye will it. Cut your seizings and draw the poles, ye harpooners. Silently obeying the order, the three harpooners now stood, with the detached iron part of their harpoons some three feet long, held barbs up before him. Stab me not with that keen steel. Cant them, cant them over. Know ye not the goblet end? Turn up the socket. So, so, now ye cup-bearers advance. The irons, take them, hold them while I fill. Forthwith, slowly going from one officer to the other, 
He brimmed the harpoon sockets with the fiery waters from the pewter. Now, three to three ye stand. Commend the murderous chalices. Bestow them, ye who are now made parties to this indissoluble league. Ha! Starbuck! But the deed is done. Yon ratifying sun now waits to sit upon it. Drink, ye harpooners! Drink and swear, ye men that man the deathful whale-boat's bow. Death to Moby Dick! God hunt us all if we do not hunt Moby Dick to his death! The long, barbed steel goblets were lifted, and to cries and maledictions against the white whale, the spirits were simultaneously quaffed down with a hiss. Starbuck paled, and turned and shivered. Once more, and finally, the replenished pewter went the rounds among the frantic crew, when, waving his free hand to them, they all dispersed, and Ahab retired within his cabin. CHAPTER Thirty Seven. Sunset. The cabin, by the stern windows, Ahab sitting alone, and gazing out. I leave a white and turbid wake, pale waters, paler cheeks where'er I sail. The envious billows sidelong swell to whelm my track. Let them. But first I pass. Yonder, by the ever-brimming goblet's rim, the warm waves blush like wine. The gold brow plums the blue. The diver sun, slow dived from noon, goes down. My soul mounts up. She wearies with her endless hill. Is then the crown too heavy that I wear, this iron crown of Lombardy? Yet it is bright with many a gem. I, the wearer, see not its far flashings but darkly feel that I wear that that dazzlingly confounds. Tis iron, that I know, not gold. Tis split, too, that I feel. The jagged edge galls me so. My brain seems to beat against the solid metal. I steel skull mine, the sort that needs no helmet from the most brain-battering fight. Dry heat upon my brow, Oh, time was, when as the sunrise nobly spurred me, so the sunset soothed. No more. This lovely light, it lights not me. All loveliness is anguish to me, since I can ne'er enjoy. Gifted with the high perception, I lack the low enjoying power. Damned most subtly and most malignantly. Damned in the midst of paradise. Good night. Good night. Waving his hand, he moves from the window. It was not so hard a task. I thought to find one stubborn at the least, but my one cogged circle fits into all their various wheels, and they revolve. Or, if you will, like so many ant hills of powder, they all stand before me, and I their match. Oh, hard! that to fire others the match itself must needs be wasting. What I've dared I've willed, and what I've willed I'll do. They think me mad. Starbuck does. But I'm demoniac. I am madness maddened. That wild madness that's only calm to comprehend itself. The prophecy was that I should be dismembered, and I, I lost this leg. I now prophesy that I will dismember my dismemberer. Now, then, be the prophet and the fulfiller one. That's more than ye, ye great gods, ever were. I laugh and hoot at ye, ye cricket players, ye pugilists, ye deaf burks and blinded bendigos. I will not say, as schoolboys do to bullies, take someone of your own size, don't pummel me. No. You've knocked me down, and I am up again, but ye have run and hidden. Come forth from behind your cotton bags. I have no long gun to reach ye. Come, Ahab's compliments to ye. Come and see if ye can swerve me. Swerve me? You cannot swerve me, else ye swerve yourselves. Man has ye there. Swerve me? The path to my fixed purpose is laid with iron rails, 
whereon my soul is grooved to run. Over unsounded gorges, through the rifled hearts of mountains, under torrents' beds, unerringly I rush. Knots an obstacle, knots an angle to the iron way. Chapter 38 Dusk By the mainmast, Starbuck leaning against it. My soul is more than matched. She's overmanned, and by a madman. Insufferable sting that sanity should ground arms on such a field. But he drilled deep down and blasted all my reason out of me. I think I see his impious end, but feel that I must help him to it. Will I, nil I, the ineffable thing has tied me to him, toes me with a cable I have no knife to cut. Horrible old man! Who's over him, he cries. Aye, he would be a Democrat to all above. Look how he lords it over all below. Oh, I plainly see my miserable office, to obey rebelling, and worse yet, to hate with a touch of pity. For in his eyes I read some lurid woe would shrivel me up, had I it. Yet is there hope, time and tide flow wide. The hated whale has the round watery world to swim in, as the small goldfish has its glassy globe. His heaven-insulting purpose God may wedge aside. I would up heart, were it not like lead. But my whole clock's run down, my heart the all-controlling weight, I have no key to lift again. A burst of revelry from the forecastle. Oh, God, to sail with such a heathen crew that have small touch of human mothers in them, whelped somewhere by the sharkish sea. The white whale is their demigorgon. Hark! The infernal orgies! That revelry is forward. Mark the unfaltering silence aft. Methinks it pictures life. Foremost through the sparkling sea shoots the gay, embattled, bantering bow, but only to drag dark Ahab after it, where he broods within his sternward cabin, builded over the dead water of the wake and further on hunted by its wolfish gurglings. The long howl thrills me through. Peace, ye revellers, and set the watch. Oh, life, tis an hour like this, with soul beat down and held to knowledge, as wild, untutored things are forced to feed. Oh, life, tis now that I do feel the latent horror in thee. But tis not me, that horror's out of me and with the soft feeling of the human in me, yet I will try to fight ye, ye grim phantom futures. Stand by me, hold me, bind me, O oh, ye blessed influences. Chapter 39 First Night Watch, Foretop Stub, Solace, and Mending a Brace Ha! 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 Ahem! Clear my throat! I've been thinking over it ever since, and that ha-ha's the final consequence. Why so? Because a laugh's the wisest, easiest answer to all that's queer, and come what will, one's comfort's always left. That unfailing comfort is. It's all predestinated. I heard not all his talk with Starbuck, but to my poor eye Starbuck then looked something as I the other evening felt. <laughs> Be sure the old mogul had fixed him, too. I twigged it, knew it had had the gift, might readily have prophesied it. For when I clapped my eye upon his skull, I saw it. Well, Stubb, wise Stubb, that's my title. Well, Stubb, what of it, Stubb? Here's a carcass. I know not all that may be coming, but be it what it will, I'll go to it laughing. Such a waggish leering as lurks in all your horribles. I feel funny. Fala, lira, skira. What's my juicy little pair at home doing now? Crying its eyes out? <laughs> Giving a party to the last arrived harpooners, I dare say. Gay as a frigate's pennant, and so am I. fa la le ra scara Oh! We'll drink to-night with hearts as light, to love as gay as fleeting, as bubbles that swim on beaker's brim, and break on the lips while meeting. A brave stave, that. Who calls? Mr. Starbuck. Aye, aye, sir. Aside, he's my superior. 
He has his, too, if I'm not mistaken. Aye, aye, sir, just through with this job. Coming. Chapter 40. Midnight, Foxel. Harpooners and Sailors. Foresail rises and discovers the watch standing, lounging, leaning, and lying in various attitudes, all singing in chorus. Farewell and adieu to you, Spanish ladies, farewell and adieu to you, ladies of Spain. Our captains commanded, first Nantucket sailor, Oh, boys, don't be sentimental, it's bad for the digestion. Take a tonic and follow me. Sings, and all follow. Our captain stood upon the deck, a spy-glass in his hand, a viewing of those gallant whales that blew at every strand. Oh, your tubs and your boats, my boys, and by your braces stand, and we'll have one of those fine whales, hand, boys, overhand. So be cheery, my lads, may your hearts never fail, while the bold harpooner is striking the whale. Mate's voice from the quarter-deck. Eight bells there, forward. Second Nantucket sailor. Avast the chorus! Eight bells there! Do you hear, bell-boy? Strike the bell eight, thou pip, thou blackling, and let me call the watch. I've the sort of mouth for that, the hogshead mouth. So, so, thrusts his head down the scuttle. Starboleens, ahoy! Eight bells there below! Tumble up! Dutch sailor. Grand snoozing to-night, matey, fat night for that. I mark this in our old mogul's wine. It's quite deadening to some as filliping to others. We sing, they sleep. I lie down there like ground tear butts. At em again. There, take this copper pump and hail em through it. Tell em to a vast dreaming of their lasses. Tell em it's the resurrection that they must kiss their last and come to judgment. That's the way. That's it. Thy throat ain't spoiled with eating Amsterdam butter. French sailor. Hist, boys! Let us have a jig or two before we ride to anchor in Blanket Bay. What say ye? There comes the other watch. Stand by, all legs. Pip! Little Pip! Hurrah with your tambourine! Pip, sulky and sleepy. Don't know where it is. French sailor. Beat thy belly, then, and wag thy ears. Jig it, men, I say, marries the word. Hurrah! Damn me, won't you dance? Form now, Indian file, and gallop into the double shuffle. Throw yourselves! Legs! Legs! Iceland sailor. I don't like your floor, matey. It's too springy to my taste. I'm used to ice floors. I'm sorry to throw cold water on the subject, but excuse me. Maltese sailor. Me too. Where's your girls? Who but a fool would take his left hand by his right and say to himself, How do you do? Partners! I must have partners! Sicilian sailor. Aye, girls and a green. Then I'll hop with ye. Yea, turn grasshopper. Long Island sailor. Well, well, ye sulkies, there's plenty more of us. Ho corn when ye may, say I. All legs go to harvest soon. Ah, here comes the music. Now for it. Azor sailor, ascending, and pitching the tambourine up the scuttle. Here you are, Pip, and there's the windless bits. Up you mount. Now, boys. The half of them dance to the tambourine. Some go below, some sleep or lie among the coils of rigging. Oaths aplenty. Azor sailor, dancing. Go to it, Pip! Bang it, bellboy! Rig it, dig it, stig it, quig it, bellboy! Make fireflies, break the jinglers. Pip. Jinglers, you say? There goes another, dropped off, I pound it so. China sailor. Rattle thy teeth, then, and pound away, make a pagoda of thyself. French sailor. Merry mad, hold up thy hoop, Pip, till I jump through it. Split jibs, tear yourselves. Tashtego, quietly smoking. That's the white man. He calls that fun. Humph! I save my sweat. Old Manx Sailor I wonder whether those jolly lads bethink them of what they are dancing over. I'll dance over your grave, I will. That's the bitterest threat of your night women that beat headwinds round corners. Oh, Christ! To think of the green navies and the green-skulled crew. Well, well, 
Belike the whole world's a ball, as you scholars have it, and so tis right to make one ballroom of it. Dance on, lads, you're young. I was once. Third Nantucket Sailor. Spell! Oh, whew! This is worse than pulling after whales in a calm. Give us a whiff, Tash. They cease dancing and gather in clusters. Meantime the sky darkens, the wind rises. Lascar Sailor. By Brahma, boys, it'll douse sail soon. The sky-born, high-tide Ganges turned to wind. Thou showest thy black brow, Siva. Maltese Sailor, reclining and shaking his cap. It's the waves. The snow-caps turn to jig it now. They'll shake their tassels soon. Now would all the waves were women. Then I'd go drown, and chassis with them evermore. There's naught so sweet on earth. Heaven may not match it, as those swift glances of warm, wild bosoms in the dance, when the over-arboring arms hide such ripe, bursting grapes. Sicilian Sailor, Reclining Tell me not of it. Hark ye, lad, fleet interlacings of the limbs, lithe swayings, coyings, flutterings, lip, heart, hip, all graze, unceasing touch and go. Not taste, observe ye, else come satiety, eh, pagan? Nudging. Tahitian sailor, reclining on a mat. Hail, holy nakedness of our dancing girls, the heva heva, ah, low-veiled high palm Tahiti, I still rest me on thy mat, but the soft soil has slid. I saw thee woven in the wood, my mat, green the first day I brought ye thence, now worn and wilted quite. Ah, me, not thou nor I can bear the change. How then, if so be transplanted to yon sky? Hear I the roaring streams from Pirohiti's peak of spears when they leap down the crags and drown the villages? The blast! The blast! Up spine and meet it! Leaps to his feet. Portuguese sailor. How the sea rolls, swashing against the side. Stand by for reefing, hearties. The winds are just crossing swords. Pell-mell they go lunging presently. Danish sailor. Crack, crack, old ship, so long as thou crackest, thou holdest. Well done, the mate there holds ye to it stiffly. He's no more afraid than the isle fort at Kattegat, put there to fight the Baltic with storm-lashed guns, on which the sea-salt cakes. Fourth Nantucket sailor. He has his orders, mind ye that. I heard old Ahab tell him he must always kill a squall, something as they burst a water-spout with a pistol. Fire your ship right into it. English sailor. Blood. But that old man's a grand old cove. We are the lads to hunt him up his whale. All. Aye, aye. Old Manx sailor. How the three pines shake. Pines are the hardest sort of tree to live when shifted to any other soil. And here there's none but the crew's cursed clay. Steady, helmsman, steady. This is the sort of weather when brave hearts snap ashore, and keeled hulls split at sea. Our captain has his birthmark. Look yonder, boys, there's another in the sky. Lurid-like, you see, all else pitch black. Dagoo. What of that? Who's afraid of black's afraid of me? I'm quarried out of it. Spanish sailor. Aside. He wants to bully, eh? The old grudge makes me touchy. Advancing. Ay, Harpooner, thy race is the undeniable dark side of mankind, devilish dark at that. No offence. Dagoo, grimly. None. St. Jago's sailor. That Spaniard's mad or drunk, but that can't be, or else in his one case our old mogul's firewaters are somewhat long in working. Fifth Nantucket sailor. What's that I saw? Lightning? Yes. Spanish sailor. No. Dagoo showing his teeth. Dagoo springing. Swallow thine, mannequin. White skin, white liver. Spanish sailor meeting him. Knife thee hardly. Big frame, small spirit. All. A row! A row! A row! Tashtego with a whiff. A row alow and a row aloft. 
Gods and men, both brawlers. Humph! <laughs> Belfast sailor. A row! A row! A row! The virgin be blessed! A row! Plunge in with ye! English sailor. Fair play! Snatch the Spaniard's knife! A ring! A ring! Old Manx sailor. Ready formed. There, the ringed horizon. In that ring Cain struck Abel. Sweet work, right work, no? Why, then, God, mates thou the ring? Mate's voice from the quarter-deck. Hands by the halyards, in topgallant sails, stand by to reef topsails. All. The squall, the squall, jump, my jollies. They scatter. Pip, shrinking under the windlass. Jollies? Lord, help such jollies. Crish, crash, there goes the jib-stay. Blang, wang. God, duck lower, Pip. Here comes the royal yard. It's worse than being in the world woods the last day of the year. Who'd go climbing after chestnuts now? But there they go, all cursing. And here I don't. Fine prospects to em. They're on the road to heaven. Hold on hard. Jiminy, what a squall! But those chaps are worse yet. They are your white squalls, they. White squalls? White whale? Sure, sure. Here have I heard all their chat just now, and the white whale, sure, sure, but spoken of once, and only this evening, it makes me jingle all over like my tambourine. That anaconda of an old man swore him in to hunt him. Oh, thou big white god aloft there somewhere in yon darkness, have mercy on this small black boy down here. Preserve him from all men that have no bowels to feel fear.' 